Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the BHITB podcast. I'm your host, Dante Fortson. Today, we're going to be doing part two of This is Satan's America. Uh, but before we get to that, just want to remind everybody, I am banned from Facebook for another six days. Uh, so if you're still sending me messages on Facebook wondering why I haven't responded, that is why. Um, also, if you have not got your free book from BlackHistoryInTheBible.com yet, go there, put your email address in the subscription box, and you will be sent a PDF link. Make sure you click the confirmation link so you can receive updates for new shows, new um, studies, and everything else I post on there. Also, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe on Twitter. And if you like what you hear today, make sure you share it as well. And for those of you who are not yet supporting on Patreon, you should check it out. It's only a dollar. You get a bunch of free um, extras, downloadables, welcome package, and all that. It's only one book. So make sure you check that out. Um, Patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. All right, so we're going to pick up where we left off at the last show. Why did the flood happen? All right, so we talked about Noah being different from all humans on earth, right? So now we're going to discuss why the flood happened. And the reason for the flood, I'm not going to go into this too much because I usually don't talk about this anymore, but when I started ministry back in 2009, um, it was mostly involved with the supernatural, angels, demons, uh, Noah's flood, and connecting the dots on that. And if anybody hasn't read my book, As the Days of Noah Were, The Sons of God and the Coming Apocalypse, you should get it off Amazon. It's also available on Kindle. It has a ton of information about Noah's flood breakdown in there. So this is going to be a brief overview. That book is about 442 pages. And I will add this disclaimer. At the time, I had not yet come to the knowledge of who uh, we are as a people and who the Hebrews were, according to the Bible. So you will find some references in there that are technically correct, but they're misapplied to the wrong people. So um, if you can forgive that ignorance, you'll definitely enjoy the book. It's not a lot of it in there. So it's like a small section, actually. Um, you could probably skip it, and you wouldn't miss anything in context of Noah. All right, so let's dig into Noah's flood. Genesis chapter 6. Uh, verses 1 through 4 is where um, Noah's flood is going to first uh, be mentioned. And it's important to talk about this in context of deception and scripture and laying the foundation for what we're going to talk about with America because a lot of seminaries teach a certain way on this subject, and then they pass that uh, seminary teaching down to pastors, and they pass that down to the people who sit in their pulpits and the people sitting in their pulpits defend that position without ever having read a single word and understood it. They haven't researched it, and they defend that position because that's what their pastor teaches, and they listen to whatever their pastor says. They don't question it, which, again, I want to remind you of Acts 17.11. Question everything. Listen to what people are saying, and then go back and check Acts 17.11. It says go check the scriptures to see if what they're saying is true. If you're not doing that, you don't know what you're defending. You may be defending a lie. All right, so Genesis chapter 6, verses 1, 1 through 4, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. All right, so this section of text right here, all kinds of controversy, right? So men begin to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters are born unto them. Now notice it says men, or mankind in general. It's not a subset. It's not specific groups of um, humans. It's humans in general. And daughters were born unto mankind, right? It says the sons of God. Now, this right here is where we run into trouble with a lot of deception. Now, the mainstream teaching is that these were the sons of Seth. Notice it does not say Seth. It says God right there, right? The sons of, um, it actually says B'nai Ha Elohim, the sons of Elohim. Those that try to teach that these are the sons of Seth are adding in words. They're adding the word Seth where it does not appear. It says they saw the daughters of men. The Hebrew there says Banath Adam, daughters of Adam. So there's no subset. All people come from Adam and Eve. So they try to twist this into being basically saying that the sons of Seth 
saw the daughters of Cain. They switch Adam to Cain. In that case, it says they were fair. And those that teach Christian identity will try to say, well, fair means white. It doesn't. It means uh, that they, they were beautiful. They looked good. So they took them wives of all which they chose. So these sons of God, the Benai Elohim, started taking the daughters of Adam and making them wives, right? Now, if you want to know who the Benai Elohim are, all you have to do is Google the word um, or actually Google the phrase Hebrew ranks of angels. And just read the ranks of angels, and you'll see that the Benai Elohim are listed as a rank of angels in uh, Hebrew belief. Now, what's interesting is uh, the rebuttal is going to um, the rebuttal is going to be that um, angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. Right now, let's be specific here. Matthew twenty two thirty says, "For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God." In heaven, in these verses in um, Genesis, this event is not taking place in heaven. It's taking place on earth. And then, as we'll see, Jude is going to make some references, too. So we get the line of Seth theory and the opposing theory, the, the actual belief that angels came down and took human women and created offspring. The mainstream church refers to this as heresy. The reason they refer to this as heresy is because they don't want you digging back into the book of Enoch, which we just talked about. It, it describes Noah as looking different from all other people, and he looked different because he had white skin. So it's going to lead back to the book of Enoch, number one. Um, but then it starts to lead into some other sections of um, world history that we define as mythology. So in the Bible, you have this event where the angels come down and take human women and start to produce these offspring, right? Well, if you go into other religions and cultures, you see that they had the exact same stories, but they call them the gods. The gods came down and they took human women and started to create hybrid offspring. And then when you come into our modern times, we have people saying, oh, well, these aliens are coming down and taking human women and creating hybrid offspring. So the story remains consistent throughout history. The inconsistency is the mainstream Christian teaching of it that Seth line was not allowed to mix with Cain's line because Seth's line was righteous and Cain's line was not. You don't find any of that in the Bible. You don't find the name Seth or Cain, as I pointed out. You don't find any instructions for them not to get married at all. You don't find any um, reference to Seth's line being righteous. You don't find any reference to Cain's line being unrighteous. And the verses, the first verse, um, before we even get to the offspring part, it makes you question the doctrine, right? So let me show you the deception here for those who still believe this Sethite nonsense, right? If Seth's line was so righteous, why did God kill them with the flood? Why did God kill their whole line with the flood? That's a question you have to ask yourself. That means God is out there killing righteous people without cause, right? That did not deserve to die. Second, if Seth's line was so righteous, as we'll see in a minute, why did God want to wipe out the whole earth because it was corrupt and evil? We're going to get to that in a minute, though. So we see here that there's an inconsistency with their teaching, but when you look at angels having offspring of human women, that becomes consistent across history, across multiple cultures, right? So uh, getting back into uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 6, we're going to go down to verse Four, where the giants are. It says there were giants in the earth in those days. That word giants is the Hebrew word Nephilim. Google the Nephilim, and you will see that the Nephilim were hybrid angel human giants. And it says, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, people try to separate this sentence and say that these giants are not related to the angels. Now, what you'll notice is if you go read the scripture for yourself, this is one sentence. It's not several thoughts. It's one complete sentence. There were giants in the earth in those days, semicolon, and also after that, comma, when. This word when here can actually be translated as whenever, wherever. So it could read, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of men. It could mean wherever the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. So these Nephilim appeared wherever these sons of God started taking human women and having offspring, right? It says, and they bear children unto them. This is all one sentence. The same 
became the mighty men which were of all men of renown. Now, this is important. These hybrids became famous, uh, legendary men, mighty men. Everybody's heard the story of Hercules. If you read the story of Hercules, he is the result of a god, or what I believe to be an angel, mixing with a human woman. And then he has this legendary strength, and he goes on these legendary journeys. The same thing with Gilgamesh, the same thing with Achilles. And um, you have the Minotaur, and you have all these other weird creatures that pop up throughout history and stories and stuff. And you see that there are links to the Bible once you start to dig in. Now, for those people who are still skeptical, this is where we start to really, really dig into uh, Noah's flood right here, right? So the reason Noah's flood becomes such a focal point is because of Christ. And Christ in Matthew chapter 24, verses 38 through 39, he says the following when addressing his disciples about the end of the age. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the son, coming of the Son of Man be. All right, so the church's traditional teaching on this verse is that it's just going to be business as usual, right? But if we go back and look at Noah's flood for ourselves, we see all the weird stuff that I just told you was going on. Angels coming down. It only references angels marrying and giving in marriage. It, notice that in, in uh, Genesis 6, the angels were taking wives. It specifically says the sons of God were taking these wives. Now, I'll come back to the sons of God thing in a minute. But so the church teaches that these are business as usual, right? We know this is deception because this is not usual stuff. That's why the Bible pointed that out. And as we go through the rest of Genesis 6 to the flood, we'll see that it gets more and more unusual. So the lie that this is just everything is going on, everybody's doing whatever they're doing day to day, that is not a sign. Things being normal is not a sign of the end. So if you think that makes sense, you need to go back and read your Bible. So let's come back to this phrase, sons of God. But not Elohim. It is an exact Hebrew phrase. When somebody tries to twist it and say, um, well, the New Testament says this about the sons of God. That has nothing to do with what the Old Testament verbiage is. If it is not the exact phrase, Benai Ha Elohim, it does not apply to the angels. So they'll come in with, uh, well, God called Israel a son here. doesn't matter. Did he call Israel Benai Elohim? No, he did not. The angels are called Benai Elohim six times in the Bible. There's six references in the Bible. Uh, one reference occurs in, or two references occur in Job when, when Satan goes to visit God, and he comes among the Benai Elohim. It's referenced there twice in Job. It's referenced once here in Genesis. Um, in the book of Daniel, when the, the three Hebrew boys are in the fire, he's referred to, the, it says he looks like a son of God. He looks like a Benai Elohim. So you see those there, and you can check out my book. And if you go on ministerfortson.com or blackhistoryinthebible.com, in, um, in the search bar, Type in Nephilim, it'll give you a full study on all the Nephilim stuff I've written, and you can dig into that. So these are definitely angels. But how do we know that there is any validity to this theory that the angels were creating human offspring or hybrid offspring with human women? We can go to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 becomes a problem for people who do not believe the angel theory and people who call the book of Enoch heresy because 2 Peter 2, verses 4 through 7, reference events or actually reference an event that is only found in the book of Enoch and nowhere else. So here it is. It says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So he connects Noah's flood to Sodom and Gomorrah, which we're going to come back to because Jude connects it even more and tells us exactly why uh, the flood happened and Sodom and Gomorrah happened. So right here in Second Peter, he says, for God, if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus. It's the only place in the, in the New Testament that the Greek word Tartarus is used. That's Strong's number 5020, the outer darkness. Tartarus, if you get, it's only mentioned really in the Greek mythologies. 
because Tartarus was separate from hell. It was, a, it was a considered an outer darkness that was completely separate from hell as we think of it. So Peter says that these angels were cast into this, this separate place from hell, right, because of what they had done. That's only found as reference in the book of Enoch. So if you haven't read the book of Enoch, you should go read it. Um, if you, just, you can search through your Bible, too. You won't find this story in your Bible. And let's go to Jude. So Jude connects the dots even more than Peter. Peter connected the angels sinning with the flood of Noah, and he connected them the flood of Noah with Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude is going to do the same thing. Jude says, this is Jude chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. There's only one chapter in Jude. But Jude chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. All right, so you have him. Jude mentions the angels, and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. Uh, go check out the word oikaterion, O-I-K-E-T-E-R-E-O-N, I believe it is, oikaterion. I did not pull it up for the study because I didn't plan to get into it. But if you want to check out the Greek word oikaterion, go see what that means. It refers to their, the place that they live. They left this place, and it says he's reserved them under chains of darkness. The only place we find reference to angels being chained in darkness is in the book of Enoch, and then we find it in Second Peter as well, but Second Peter is also referencing the book of Enoch. Um, the reason, now Jude gets into the reason. He says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, that word even as is Hos, H-O-S, is Strong's number 5613. It means just like or exactly like. So these angels did not keep their first estate. They left their habitation. They were reserved in chains of darkness waiting for judgment. And it says, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. So what they were doing. It says, and the cities about them, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Now, here's, here's where the, people, the naysayers get into trouble. It says these angels were just like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were going after strange flesh, right? So the Greek uses the word heteros, Strong's number 2087, which means of a different kind, and Sark's Strong's number 4561, which means flesh. So these angels were going after heteros sarks, right, sexuals. The problem is that the church, mainstream church teaching on Sodom and Gomorrah is because of homosexuality. But if you go back to Genesis 18, when God tells Abraham that he will spare the cities if he can find ten righteous people, the homosexual stuff was already going on. It didn't start because the angels got there. They were already engaged in homosexuality, right? So God had said he was ready to forgive all that if he could just find ten righteous people, but he couldn't. What sent everything over the edge is when the people surrounded the house and they insisted on having sex with those angels. They wanted to rape those angels. They were going after, after strange flesh or heteros sarks. Now, that's a problem for those that teach that it was about homosexuality, especially when the word heteros is used, right? So this isn't a defense of homosexuality. It's just pointing out that there is a, a deception there in the church that, that homosexuality is unforgivable or unredeemable. Now, again, in order to be saved from something or to repent from something, you have to turn away from. So you have to turn away from that kind of lifestyle if you are truly repentant. But that wasn't why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Jude is telling us it was because they went after angelic flesh. Now, for those that say, well, angels are spirits, oh, well, let me, let me continue this real quick. And it says, um, these are set forth for an example. These are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Right? So, likewise, also, it means the same thing, likewise, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. So, again, he mentions this flesh thing, right? So this flesh thing is going to keep coming up. And let me move forward here. I don't want to get stuck on that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 39. This is for the people who do not believe angels are flesh. They say, well, angels are spirits. And, you know, they, people try to cherry pick verses instead of trying to understand context in the entirety of Scripture. Paul says this, 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 39 through 40, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beast, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So Paul here says that there is such thing as celestial bodies or celestial flesh. So these angels in Genesis 6 were going after heteros, a different kind of flesh. The, the flesh of the terrestrial is a different kind of celestial. What were the angels going after? They were going after terrestrial flesh. What were the people in Sodom going after? The people in Sodom were going after celestial flesh. So Jude breaks it down for us, and then he, the, by him mentioning that these same angels were bound in chains, he references the, the events in the book of Enoch, which the church doesn't want to talk about. They want to misdirect from that because it leads back to all the stuff we said before. So hybridization was going on, just like in, in our time now, because Christ said that when he comes back, it'll be just like the days of Noah. I mentioned Hercules, Achilles, Gilgamesh, these heroes, these epic heroes. We haven't, to our knowledge, seen that in our time yet, and we may not see it. It doesn't mean that every single um, thing that happened in Noah's time is going to happen. It just means it's going to be a similar time. And you could actually teach the second coming and a lot of the gospel out of just Noah's flood if you know what to look for. So you have God's coming judgment on the world presented in the days of Noah, where Noah's preaching and telling people, hey, this is coming, this is coming, and nobody is suspecting this, right? Now, it says Noah was perfect. We're going to um, we're going to get uh, skip down to that. Now, I want you to read chapter 6 yourself, the whole thing, because I'm not going to read every verse. So as you get down in the verses, it says Noah was perfect in his generations. The Hebrew word for perfect is uh, tamim, T-A-M-I-M. It means without physical spot or blemish, uh, without defect, unblemished, blameless. That's Strong's number 8549, right? Now, people say this just means he was good. No, because Noah was perfect and just. The just is a reference to his moral, moral character. The to mean part is a reference to his physical, his, his DNA, some of us believe, because of all the mixing that was going on. And the reason we make this connection is because of Exodus 12.5. In Exodus 12.5, it's describing the sacrifice of the lamb, and it says the lamb has to be to mean without blemish. So if the lamb has to be to mean, we know the lamb doesn't have to be moral because there's no moral law for animals to keep, as far as we know. That would refer to its physical nature had to be without blemish. And it's the same word used for Noah, without blemish. So Noah was untainted by these events, which in my opinion means his children were untainted. And if the point was to have an untainted group of people, that means the wives of Noah and his children were untainted too. And you'll find that there is a deception surrounding that. There's a um, false belief that one of the sons of Noah, when we get to the sons of Noah, we're going to talk about that, but they believe the son of Ham, or I'm sorry, the wife of Ham um, was possibly carrying Nephilim DNA. And that false teaching mostly comes from Rob Skiba. Uh, he has a lot of false teachings that he likes to push, uh, but that one is one of them. And it's basically in an attempt to say that black people carry the Nephilim gene, Right. They want to put this on black people and say black people are responsible for the hybrids and black people carried over the Nephilim gene. And because the wife of Ham is um, the mother of all black people, then black people carry recessive Nephilim genes, which, again, is in conflict with what we read in Scripture about the color of Christ, the color of Adam. It's in conflict with what we've seen historically in the book of Enoch where it says the, the children of the Nephilim or the children of the angels have white skin. So it's, it's an attempt to twist everything the opposite. So we see the enemy's fingerprints all over that false teaching. So let's go down to verse 11. It says, the earth was also corrupted before God, and the earth was filled with violence. This is the reason for the flood. The earth was corrupted before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So how was the earth corrupt and filled with violence if the sons of Seth were so righteous, right? And if the, they weren't supposed to mix, why were the sons of Seth disobeying God and taking the, the daughters of Cain as wives if Cain's line was evil and God told them not to mix? You would think that if they were the righteous line, they would behave righteously and not do unrighteous things, right? This tells you that this, this whole idea that the Sethites were mixing with Cain's offspring is nonsense. 
It's completely fabricated. It doesn't line up with scripture. And once you start poking at it, it, it falls apart completely, right? So the, the daughters of Cain seem to be the innocent ones in the situation, and the sons of Seth are the guilty ones, and yet they teach you that the sons of Seth were righteous and the daughters of Cain were immoral. Nonsense. So when you six, Genesis 6.11, the earth was corrupt. The, the Hebrew word corrupt, shakath, strong number 78.43, means destroyed, blemished, polluted, ravaged. So the earth was destroyed before God. It was blemished before God. It was polluted before God. It was ravaged. The earth was messed up. And it says it was filled with violence. This isn't really, um, this is more interesting here than anything significant. Hamas, the Hebrew word for violence, is Strong's number 2555. The earth was filled with Hamas. Google Hamas, if you don't know who they are, they are a um, very violent uh, Muslim or organization in the Middle East or what we call the Middle East, Northeast Africa. Um, it is just one of those interesting points that's in there. Uh, I wouldn't take too much uh, stock in it prophetically, and it, it possibly could be very prophetic other than, you know, outside of just the violence comment. But we see the earth today. It's basically filled with violence. We see cops getting paid to kill black people in the streets. As soon as they kill one, as soon as they kill one of us, they get a paid vacation. We see this happening overseas. We see all the violence happening overseas. We see violence everywhere. People are supposed to be at a peaceful protest, and we're seeing guns being fired, people being killed with cars and riots breaking out and tear gas. And I mean, it's all kind of crazy stuff. Even a peaceful protest eventually turns violent. So more importantly, the most important thing here that we can take away from the Noah flood story Besides all the signs and all the what – the, what deceptions to look out for, there aren't any laws or commandments in the Noah story. There are no written laws or commandments. This is something that the camps will not talk about because even though many, many of them will profess to believe in Christ and they will profess to believe parts of the Gospels, Christ said it would be like the days of Noah. But they won't go back to the days of Noah and teach you that there were no laws or commandments, Right. That's one thing that the church does teach. The mainstream church does teach that the laws and commandments are done away with, which we'll get to later, and you can listen to some of the previous uh, podcasts if you want to get deeper into that. But the only way to, for Noah to gain salvation was through grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. That was it. He didn't sacrifice his way to salvation. And not only that, Noah was not a Hebrew. People forget that. And the camps that teach Hebrew-only salvation – they have to explain how Noah obtained salvation, and Noah's not a Hebrew because the Hebrews hadn't come around yet. If you want to um, get technical, uh, people, many people don't believe that the Hebrews actually became Hebrews until Eber, who comes through uh, Shem, which is Noah's son. So unless if Noah was a Hebrew, then the problem becomes if Noah was a Hebrew, then that means Shem, Ham, and Jacob are all Hebrews. Everybody's Hebrews, right? They don't teach that. I don't believe Noah was a Hebrew, which, but I do believe Noah obtained salvation. Right? So you have to kind of look at the doctrine people are teaching, and you have to really go back and dig into the scriptures and start to ask a lot of questions. So actually, we're about to run out of time, so we're going to continue this. I'm going to set up another show for tomorrow and follow up with this, and tomorrow we're definitely going to get into the sons of Noah. We're going to talk about division. We're going to talk about um, the nations and how they were spread out and the lies surrounding nations. And the reason we're going through all this is to lay the foundation of the deception that is occurring in America so that you can see the fingerprint of the enemy all throughout history trying to demonize, setting up the, the lie to demonize the Hebrew people based on the color of our skin. So if you enjoyed this, make sure you share it. Make sure you um, leave some comments if you have any questions. So I'll be back tomorrow. Until then, I'm out. Now, your favorite music apps are available on Contour from Cox. Go from watching a musical to listening to your favorite music. Enjoy a country western and then a country jam. Go from a love story to love songs. Or go from action flicks to something that makes you feel like an action hero. Now with Contour from Cox. Now your favorite music apps are available on Contour from Cox. Go from watching a musical to listening to your favorite music 
Enjoy a country western. And then a country jam. Go from a love story to love songs. Or go from action flicks to something that makes you feel like an action hero. Now with Contour from Cox.